Hello, and welcome to Stumble Upon. I'm Austin. And I'm Emily. Today we're going to be discussing Ahmed Dovar's Women on the Verge of a Nervous Breakdown. As always, there will be spoilers and plenty of swearing. But if that doesn't scare you, then make a bowl of gazpacho, put on your best 80s fashion, because we're going to be discussing family dinners. Austin, would you like to give us the synopsis? Yeah. Women on the Verge of a Nervous Breakdown is about Peppa, a television actress, and the people she encounters after embarking on a journey to discover why her lover abruptly left her. So, Em, do you want to give us a little bit about Spain and where Almodovar was coming out of culturally at this moment? Well, yes, I would. So Franco had ruled over Spain from 1939 to 1975 as a dictator, and he was not a nice man. His repression of political opponents, forced labor camps, concentration camps, and executions, along with wartime killings, led to about 100,000 to 200,000 dead by his own actions. His reign was marked by brutal repression. So what you have here is Almodovar coming out in 1935, beginning his film career, Mm-hmm. coming from a place of pure repression yeah. and silence. And as a as a queer man, he was feeling the effects of this repression profoundly. Yeah, and it, it it's also should be noted that a lot of the great artists that were Spanish had fled because of Franco's repression. You have you have an example of uh, of uh, Lorca who was murdered by Franco's uh, regime by his his goon squad, but you have Bunuel who leaves, you have Dolly, who leaves. You have uh, Jose Larraz, who leaves. You have a whole bunch of really important culturally uh, cinematic and uh, artistic people who just get the fuck out because otherwise they're the monoculture that Franco was trying to instill had no space or room for any other, anything that could be considered other, anything that was questioning anything at all. Exactly. So... Here we are, 40 years trapped in this regime of silence and repression. And we have Almodovar coming out and beginning his career as a filmmaker. And please note that he lost his ability to go to film school because Franco shut it down. Mm-hmm. Uh, so he had he was com- a complete autodidact. He taught himself mm-hmm. how to make film. And in that moment, as, they're, as Spain is coming out of this repression, they're discovering that they need to discover speech and imagery for the first time. Mm -hmm. And so he's part of this exciting new wave of, of artists who are getting to try things on for the first time. Yeah. I remember hearing a story about his early, early career when he, after he got his first paycheck, he bought himself a super eight camera and that he would show his films at like local stores or, or cafes or bars, wherever he could fucking get them up. And he didn't have enough for uh, to do audio tracks at the same time, so he would narrate all the characters who were performing on his, in his films live to the audiences, which I think also ties into a lot of the the playful narration or playful uh, dubbing that takes place in Women on a Verge. I think that it probably is a nod to himself or a nod to his own kind of upbringings that he's now twelve years or so into his career and he can he can start to have a past in which he looks at. But that is something that is really, I think, important to kind of note about this time, at least for him and the work that he was doing, of the relationship to the past and what kind of relationship they were having. And the exploration of living in the present. Mm -hmm. I would say that his work specifically is really interesting in the intense exploration of the fleeting present. Mm-hmm. the experience of now because what was is is completely rejected mm-hmm. so what is which had been re- what he was was completely rejected yeah but also the past is being rejected by yeah. everyone and madrid is this explosion of madness and culture and mm-hmm. discovery yeah and color yeah and and being able to create your own narrative from a null place where you have like where you where you have existed in this void, this void of history of like being a non-person or a non-entity for the first portion of your life, or for some people for the past 40 years of their life, having to choose silence and and non-existence as their primary way of life. Almodovar t- discussed how he worked as a telephone technician. Mm-hmm. And 
he loved doing that job prior to becoming a filmmaker, which is what he really loved doing, because it gave him an insight into worlds he had never previously experienced. Mm. So he got to go into the homes of all kinds of people, every class, every type of person. He experienced their interior private worlds. Mm -hmm. And I think you really see that reflected in this very specific film Mm -hmm. with the use of the phone, the phone operator, the constant, like, the breaking of disconnection, the disconnection of communications. Mm -hmm. Like, it's so interesting to me, his his passion for communication and his work as a telephone repair person Mm -hmm. uh, for so long prior to getting into being a filmmaker. I just really feel like that is such a, a wonderful little connection yeah i feel like i feel like you can make you can easily make an argument that the reason that he cares for all these small side characters in the film that these people who just show up randomly and have maybe a scene scene and a half is due in part to what you're saying right there which is that he he really enjoyed the time he spent meeting random people that would not be part of his periphery or not be part of the main thrust of his life. But you think about the characters in this film outside of the main thrust, like you have the motorcyclist and his girlfriend, you have the front desk lady to the hotel, to the, I apa- love the front desk lady to the apartment. You have his mother playing the, uh, the news reporter. Is that his mother? I believe that's his mother. <gasps> you have, you have all these really small parts like even even the attorney, the the lawyer, the feminist lawyer, uh, has a small part, but she she pops, and I think that there's an element of him just being, or or the receptionist, the fucking receptionist is so who's so great, and she shows up in Tie Me Up, Tie Me Down, which is a film I think he makes right after this, and she's it's, amazing, and and there's just so many people who pop, and. And in other films, I'm not going to say lesser or greater films, in other films, these small characters don't matter. They will just be part of the background. They they just are there to shut up and say their lines, which Mm -hmm. sounds stupid, but you you, just, I don't care. Just say your line. Don't fuck it up. Don't draw from anybody else. And in this, his world is like, no, every single person here is important to hear. We need to hear them speak. We need to have them be part of it. It is very interesting point to make since you think about the repression of speech under Franco's rule. Of course, of course, Almodovar would would want to have every character be important and have a moment Mm -hmm. because everyone was silenced. Everyone was silenced. Yeah. So everyone does matter. Mm -hmm. Every voice is important. Mm -hmm. And I love that. Was there something that struck out to you about like the structure of the film to me, like it's such an interesting mash of like a screwball comedy and like a melodrama of the fifties. Like it's like this, just a smashing of these two very, like very symbiotic, but seemingly antithetical art, like uh, archetypes of cinema. Mm -hmm. And like, I think it starts with like, for me, it starts with just the fucking production design of this film, yes. which is so colorful. Like, like I will so never vibrant. I will never get over the fact that I think she has four couches, but she might have more. I, I have. Think she has eight hundred couches. Like is she, she might like there. There are so many moments where you're like, she might be a red flag. <laughs> like, the amount like, of couches should be a red flag. Like Peppa is kind of a lot, and she might be. She might be just a red flag. Oh, Peppa is extra. Yeah, she is extra as a. Fuck, mm-hmm. and those the n- number of couches is extraordinary, mm-hmm. and that they are layered. Yeah. So you have a one layer of couches, and then you behind you have another higher up layer of couches. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm here for it. Yeah, but it, it it does tie into kind of the thrust of the of the film, like taking the idea of of what the what the title is that these women are on the verge of a nervous breakdown. They're on the verge of something. Like, it could be a nervous breakdown. It could be a change in their life. They're on the verge of something. Spain was on the verge of a nervous breakdown. Mm-hmm. Madrid was on the verge of a nervous breakdown. Mm-hmm. If you think about that moment was made in 1988, um, there was a heroin epidemic going on. Mm-hmm. There was it just in- insanity on the streets because, of course, everybody wanted to participate in everything. Everybody yeah. wanted to feel. Everyone wanted to be extra. Yeah. So it makes sense that... That these characters are obviously, all of them are on the verge of chaos. Mm-hmm. 
um, as it was reflected in the city itself. Yeah. But also just, yeah, her, in, let's discuss the interiors. Let's discuss the yeah. chaos of the interior because the interior set design, mm-hmm. I think uh, we discussed earlier, is really the the chaos of their interior minds. Yeah. Like everyone is is extra. Yeah. Like you think of, the, you think of Peppa's house because, so structurally the film has a few scenes that are outside of her house, Correct. but the majority of the film takes place in her apartment. Yeah. Really it, in that living room. Yeah. It's very theatrical in that regards. But in that you have four or more couches, you have a terrace that has ducks and chickens and all sorts of birds living Bunnies. there. Bunnies. Yep. She, she has, uh, she has a, a bedroom that she burns her bed in. Which was awesome. Which is a, yeah, it's a great scene. Like, there's another room, it seems, that she is, that has a dressing room. She has an apartment that has 2,400 square feet of crazy. Yeah. Like, it's just all, it's all a lot. And so bright. Yeah. So much red. And, and such a nice reminder that the 80s were not a great time for design elements because <laughs> most of the things that are in it are just fucking trash. So many great shoulder pads. But, yeah. Oh, God. God. <laughs> but it's it's fascinating because like you think about how she handles or interacts with her interior. She burns her bed. Mm-hmm. She destroys her phone multiple times. Breaks a lot of windows. Breaks a lot of windows. Destroys her... Uh, her answering machine. Like, record player. The well, rec- just the records anyway. Like she she is haphazardly working through her her trauma in yeah. a lot of ways through her design. Mm-hmm. It's great. I love her smashing things. Yeah. It's very satisfying. Yeah. To watch her smash things. The thing that I, I really want to hit on that I think is really interesting and fascinating about this film is how the characters are presented because while they are all on a on the verge of a nervous breakdown all the women the men on the other hand are just kind of weak outside of the taxi driver the taxi driver is amazing mumbo taxi the the aban and his son carlos are really fascinating in how weak and like ruled by the power of boners by the power of boners there's this incredible scene near the end of the film about 50 minutes into the runtime where avon comes to pick up his uh suitcase Mm -hmm. and uh and peppa has taken his suitcase from being downstairs where his son brought it i'm going to give a quick synopsis of this like the scenario in the house absolutely before i get into this so peppa and avon have been lovers for a few years it's it's not said how long, but it's been a while. Vaughn has decided that he is going to leave Peppa. Mm-hmm. Peppa is distraught. Peppa decides to put her apartment up on the market and move into a smaller place because she doesn't need that much room. She also finds out that she's pregnant. So she's trying to get in touch with Vaughn to give him the information about her pregnancy and to figure out what the fuck is going on, mm-hmm. just in general. Meanwhile... Bond's son, Carlos, is trying to move out of the apartment that he lives in with his mother and her parents into some place with his girlfriend. Mm-hmm. And Carlos and his girlfriend show up at Peppa's apartment to rent it out of happenstance or out of structural necessity because this is a script and every, <laughs> and they're just writing it and they're like, oh no, it's no circumstances. Way it's circumstantial. Funnier. It's better if this fucking happens. So they show up and Peppa figures out has, figures out that this is a Bond son that she had no idea about, even though she's been with him for years. Yeah, never heard of him. It's crazy. Ne- never heard. And so Yvonne meanwhile... Sucks. Uh, yeah, Bond sucks. Meanwhile, a Bond keeps leaving messages and... Trying to... Uh, In air quotes, trying. Yeah, try, trying serious air quotes. Trying to get in touch with her. Trying to get in touch with her in the most fuckboy sort of way possible. Mm-hmm. Oh, he's a total fuckboy. And so he's so, so he's doing all this like work to try to get in touch with her while also trying to set up his getaway plan with his new girlfriend who is this feminist lawyer that... Ties into the plot in a different way, which we can talk about later. But anyway, he shows up at the apartment, believing that, at Peppa's apartment, believing that his bag is going to be downstairs because his son has told him 
that he brought it downstairs mm-hmm. on a phone call that he had with him. Correct. Peppa, having none of that shit, Mm-mm. has brought it back up to the top floor. And then, after bringing it up to the top floor, collects all the rest of his shit and then walks outside to throw all of his shit in the trash. Yes. It's wonderful. Yeah. And it's just, like, the structure of the scene, like, how it's shot, because at the same time, Abon's ex-partner, Carlos's mother, who has lost the plot, is walking to Peppa's house to confront her about Yvonne. Yvonne. Thinking they're running away together. Right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Little does she know. Little does she know. Meanwhile, back at the ranch. Structurally, this is amazing. Yeah. There is a lot of meanwhile back at the ranch. Yeah. Multiple stories happening at the same time. Mm-hmm. It's fantastic. There is a lot of that in this. This is very much a screwball comedy. You bring up the structure. And one of the things Almodovar does really well in this film is blend the genres. Mm-hmm. So you have, you've you got your baseline of the screwball comedy, the absurdity of it all. You have a bit of tension and thriller elements with the pacing back and forth, trying to figure out who's doing what, the, the Shiite terrorist plot going on here, the potential murder, the ex-wife shooting at... Uh, Peppa uh, in the in the Mambo taxi, you know. So you've got a lot of different different elements happening, and and mm-hmm. you see it as well not only in the structure of the script, but in the structure of how they're setting up the shots. Uh-huh. So at the beginning, when uh, Peppa faints because she's pregnant and and exhausted and all of the reasons, uh, she faints when she's doing the dubbing in the recording studio. Mm-hmm. You have that wonderful like really low angle through her glasses. Mm-hmm. And so we we get uh, tips tip of the hat from Almodovar all the time throughout this film. The things are not as they seem mm-hmm. and that this isn't just a straight genre piece. Like you are going to be seeing a lot of different elements in this. Yeah, and it's a film that knows what it's telling you because mm-hmm. that scene that she faints in, she's dubbing a scene for an American film about and the scene that she's dubbing is about two people who used to have passion for each other, but don't anymore. Mm -hmm. Like, so it's not like, it's a very, like, it's a, it's a self-referential sort of acknowledgement of what this story is going to be. This is something that they are going to be, that these people are going to be living through and we're going to recognize and we're going to notice things about the structure. It's very, it's very aware that you're as smart as it is. Well, and it's also uh, giving her a chance to talk to him, Mm -hmm. but it's false. You know, she's not actually talking to him. She's suppo- She was supposed to be dubbing it with him, mm-hmm. but she slept through it because she had taken the sleeping pills because she couldn't sleep because she was so upset about the breakup. Mm-hmm. So she wasn't able to communicate with him in person. And now she's talking to him through the script and, and her heart is breaking again by having to play this character whose heart is breaking mm-hmm. and to have his voice being over the the headphones to yeah. her. So she's having to hear him say these things that she isn't getting to communicate with him about. Mm-hmm. And it's it's such a burn. And so you have this happen over and over again, this miscommunication, this yeah. missed communication. Yeah. And it's something oh, that... The, the damn answering machine. Oh, the frustration of answering machines. <laughs> it just don't know. You don't know about it now. If you didn't grow up with answering machines, you don't know how yeah. frustrating they are. Busy signals. Yeah. So frustrating. Or fast forwarding through a message to try to get to the end, to the next one. And like, oh, God damn it. Oh, yes. When her friend calls <laughs> in and is just leaving all these voice messages. Yeah. Oh, I love her friend. Yeah. Candela. Candela is fucking oh. amazing. <laughs> She's so funny. Yeah. Candela is the reason that the they bring in the that Peppa runs into the uh, feminist lawyer because oh. she has had a love affair with a Shiite terrorist yes. who is uh, now planning to blow up a plane or to hijack a plane. Hijack, hijack a, plane a plane to Stockholm. Yes. So and she's taken refuge at Peppa's house because she's- everybody. Everybody takes refuge at your house when you don't need them there. Yes. Talk about... I love this film because of the way the women are uh, written. Mm-hmm. And it's these complex characters. Everybody's a complex character. Yep. Nobody is... Not even down to the wonderful front desk lady is is a is just... None of them are surface. So in complete contrast to Boonwell, mm-hmm. where everybody was just surface shitheads, yeah. everyone here has a purpose and a place and... Mm-hmm. And has a, an opinion, 
and and are willing to stake their claim on their opinion. So yeah. the front desk lady, when she talks to Iban and he's like, well, just, you know, don't mention that I was here. And she's like, I can't. My religion does not allow me to lie. And no. I don't want to. And, you know, I wouldn't be here if I didn't have to be like that. I wish it wasn't the thing I had to do. Yeah. And you bring up something interesting with talking about Bunuel in that, because I, I, I imagine that none of these women, none of these characters, period, would know how to drink a martini properly no like they would all drink it the way that the fucking uh chauffeur drinks it in a uh, discreet charm yeah. like like none of them would have any sort of understanding or care for the social constructs Ivan like, would he Ivan would because he would have studied it he might i would say he i think that you're right i think that he would have studied it but depending on the group of people he was around he would be malleable to the mm. social construct because he is such a a squirmy, Bindless. whiny bastard. <laughs> but tell me how you really feel. I think he's a great. Partner. I think you loved him. Yeah, I, I, like, if yeah. I could get him to move in and just like we, I could learn something from him and on how to, how to treat people. Yeah, It'd be really. He's just so I would thoughtful. learn a lot. You would be such a better person if yeah. you hung out with Iban all the time. Yeah, he's just like your best friend. Uh, uh, Iban and his harem of imaginary women that <laughs> that, that Peppa <laughs> Peppa dreams. Oh yes, the whole dream sequence at the beginning. Yeah. where I guess yes. Do you, do you think that's as a dream? I I I think it can read as a dream. I think. It can also read as a commercial that yeah, he was doing. It like had a commercial vibe. Yeah, like it's. I, was it a blending yeah. of a commercial and her dream because she's supposed to be doing the VO record? I I think that there's so much. The th- you said the thing that you love about the film. The thing that I love about the film is that it is so so interested in being fun and energetic mm-hmm. that while I like it, it, it's so fun and being interested in, in being energetic that. It's amazing that it keeps its its structure in in place. Like compared to something like Daisies or or other avant garde films. Oh, that film! Someday we should watch that again for this. I did and just, watch it again and, and just make you just sit there and live live watch it. Anyway, like there's there's an element of like look it up, Daisies. Like it, it's a beautiful uh, film from the Czech New Wave. Yeah, actually, it is really good. Because everybody gets a new wave. Every fucking cinema can, gets a new wave. Because, can we get a new wave? Can Philly get a new wave? Yeah, we get. Everybody gets a new wave. We want a new wave. Philly new wave. Yeah, cinema. Cinema has like for as interesting and fascinating as it can be, we have really, really limited ourselves in what we have as new expressions. Like, ah, oh, the Japanese new wave. Ah, oh, the Czech new wave. Ah, oh, the French new wave. Ah, oh, the, the Soviet new wave. Ah, ah, ah. Like, cool. Philly new wave. You're like, cool. Could you, could, for something that is so interesting and fascinating and different, can we find a different term nope. for it? We have one term. We have one term and that's all we're going to fucking do. every form of cinema. There's one person out there being like, <laughs> oh, I hear, I hear you have a lot of things. Uh, I'm hitting new wave, new wave. We're new. It's a new wave now. I'm here for it. <laughs> I'm here for it. I keep it simple. Yeah. You know what? It's a branding and it works. Yes. And what I was saying was <laughs> that even though, uh, like, even though the film is so full of energy and so like bright in both of its color scheme and as well as like, like the energy that's coming in. So much great energy. It, it could feel free to become like our, it could have anarchy. Like the film could devolve into anarchy really, really easily structurally and, and character choice wise, but a testament to Almodovar and, and everybody who worked on this film it is so tight mm-hmm. in its structure that the chaos that comes from the characters doesn't need to extend into the plotting. It's already fucking nuts enough. It doesn't need to start becoming the film itself works because I think it doesn't become like just chaos structurally. So would you say to compare and contrast with Bunuel, mm-hmm. um, the the simplicity of the insanity of Boonwell's piece Mm -hmm. where you're just, it doesn't, it is chaos because the connections, they don't make sense. Like what, what is happening? We're having, Mm -hmm. you know, the military exercises in the middle of dinner. Mm -hmm. We're, we're trauma dumping on you at, while you can't get anything to drink. That is so chaotic. Mm -hmm. And this actually, and this piece is actually chaotic Mm -hmm. and and insane and energy through the roof and costumes and design through the roof. Mm -hmm. But the chaos is structured. And yeah. so you're saying that you, you can have one, but not both. 
I, or you can't have both, but I'm not sure I would I would go to the place of saying you can't have one without the other, specifically in relation to these two films. What I think is interesting is that they're both as chaotic as each other. One is just through performance and the other is through like, subject. Subject and, and structure. In Boonwell, he's like, you know, now we're gonna have a scene that is narrated by a character we've never met about another character we've never met who is letting prisoners free. Yeah, and, and what you're saying is also, he's, again, we talked about this last time, he was flipping types on their head. Mm -hmm. So your expectation is a bishop would go and absolve a dying man. Mm -hmm. Your expectation would not be he would then turn around and murder him. Yeah. But in this, our expectations, we don't know what our expectations are. We don't know these people. So as we get to know them in Almodovar's film, it's just, we're just letting it, explode around us it's mm -hmm. just little little explosions everywhere yeah and and we're here for it we're just here yeah. for the ride i i would also say that the hypocrisies of the people are so much smaller mm. like the plot from our uh, fr the, the 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 arc that peppa has from dreaming about somebody else's narrative to her being in control of hers is a lot simpler than what's happening in Boonwell, but everywhere around it is chaos mm. Whereas Boonwell's like, no, we're going to have this really simple structure. People are trying to get dinner. That's all they're doing. And we're going to have all this nut jobs around this that is going to divert from your understanding or divert from what your attention is being is supposed to be on. Which is actually really interesting because essentially it's the same thing. Mm -hmm. Boonwell, we just want to have dinner. Mm -hmm. And here's the insanity trying to do that and not being able to accomplish it. For Peppa, she just wants to talk mm -hmm. to Iban. Yeah. That is all she wants to do is have a fucking five minute conversation with him mm -hmm. and tell him what's going on and then see how it lands. Mm -hmm. And she cannot do it. But the difference is there's a resolution. Yeah. When she gets to him at the end, mm -hmm. she she finally can have that conversation. He's ready to have that conversation. Let's go get a drink. Let's sit down. Let's talk. I'll catch the next flight. No big deal. And she's like, no, I don't need to. Mm -hmm. Two hours ago, I could have. Mm -hmm. But not anymore. You missed that up. So she has an evolution. So yeah. unlike the surrealism of Bunuel... Mm -hmm. Where we're just in a circle forever in the hamster wheel. Yeah. Uh, Almodovar is, he's kind to his characters. He mm -hmm. loves them. Yeah. And you think like this is what, 16 years later mm -hmm. or so from, from it. And, and that's the evolution of where they are. Like it ne Franco was never going to be out of power in 72. Mm -mm. He was going to live forever. Like no matter what, even if you knew that he was frail and he was at the end of his end of his time, you're going to imagine that somebody else was going to take power in that vacuum and you weren't going to have a democratic society or a, a release a, a something that was anti antithetical to a, a dictatorship yeah and Boonwell was in his 70s himself yeah so like having spent his whole life dealing with that shit like obviously you're that you're always going to be on the road walking towards mm -hmm. something that is never going to have any resolution mm -hmm. whereas now in 88 when uh, when Almodovar makes this film there is a resolution to a sense. Like mm -hmm. there is a changing of how do you relate to your past? Like how, like when you didn't have a past before, how can you, how can you move forward with a new one now? And I think about that, like in, in character structure, if you look at the core relationship in the film, you have a bond and you have Peppa and you have, uh, what is the fuck? Lucia, Lucia. The ex-wife. The ex-wife. The ex-partner. We don't know if they were ever married. Right, we don't know. Like, we, it's never... Ex-lover. Ex yes, ex-lover. So you have three people. You have Lucia, who's stuck in the past. You have a Bon, who is running from his past. And you have Peppa, who is making a transition from the past to her present. Mm -hmm. and, and importantly, I think that that, I think that that matters in this sense, that it's her changing from being related to a guy her past being tied to a man to her pa to her future being about herself mm -hmm. like even in the last fucking scene of the film when she walks back into her apartment after she uh has stopped the attempt on uh on Yvonne's life by Lucia mm -hmm. at the at, at the airport which is a whole nother fucking thing and stopped and essentially stopped the terrorist attack on the flight yes uh, she comes back to her apartment to a scene in which she's created. She's made this mess. She earlier in the day she uh, made a whole bunch of gazpacho. 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 Sorry, 
and uh, and put a whole bunch of sleeping pills in it to try to keep a bond. Through the course of events at her house, a group of police officers came over, a telephone repairman came over. She has a bond son. We have her friend, her friend, and his, his fiance and his and his, and his fi- mama. Yeah. All there. And everybody but Peppa and Lucia have drunk the gazpacho. And uh, they're passed out. Everybody's just on the floor. Mm-hmm. I love passed this out. scene so much. Sleeping for however long. It's such a good scene. But she like, she walks outside and what's his name? Carlos? Mm-hmm. Carlos's fiance partner is just waking up from her bout with uh, uh, the sleeping pills. Yes, poor Marissa slept through the whole movie. The whole movie. Uh, though she does have her sexual debut while she is uh, sleeping, she does. So she's no longer a virgin. Yeah, and and as we know by the last line of the film, virgins are such bitches. They are bitches, <laughs> according according to Marissa. Yes, and Bippa. <laughs> but <laughs> but but back to your point of of her evolution. Yeah, of Peppa's evolution, that she sits there in that moment with Marissa, um, having this sunrise, watching the sun come up. Mm-hmm. And just her realization that she loves the apartment, she loves her animals, mm-hmm. she loves the insanity of those animals on her deck, all the flowers. She loves her view. Yes, like, her view. She her, loves her view of Madrid. And, 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 and quite literally, that's fascinating. She loves her view. From this, from this position in her life now, with all the things that are laid out in front of her, a, an apartment full of passed out people who will probably arrest her for that action. She loves her view. Yeah. She loves what she's looking at. This chaotic life and chaotic day and a half that she has gone through, she loves how it looks to her. And there's something really nice and uplifting about that element Mm -hmm. for the film, especially with looking at all the other things here, like looking at the past, how people are related to that, how she's related to all these people and how they're all of the things, all the things that have mashed together to create this uh, gazpacho of her life. (laughs) Uh, <laughs> I mean, if this isn't making you hungry, I don't know what will. Uh, like, it's a great view to have. Like, yeah. And like, then she's, gets, she's a new mom, mm-hmm. and she's excited about this next adventure, yeah. and she's not a fugitive anymore. And, and, <laughs> and, and importantly, she never told a bond. Mm-mm. He doesn't know. Yeah. Who gives a shit what that guy thinks? Well, clearly, uh, from his experience with beautiful baby Antonio Banderas, mm-hmm. he has no interest in being a papa. Yeah. And so she's realizing, mm, screw this guy. Yeah. I can do this on my own. And it's so progressive. Mm -hmm. One of the things that we came across in kind of researching and reading about this film is that there's a lot of importance at this time in cinema and especially for Almodovar's cinema of of living in the moment Mm -hmm. and thinking about the Antonio Banderas character and even the Canela character, how their relationship evolves in the film and living for this specific moment. Because... Antonio Banderas' character, Carlos, cannot keep it in his pants. Like, he just is fucking trying to kiss Canela over and over and over again, even though his girlfriend is passed out on the goddamn... Fiancé. <laughs> yeah, fiancé is passed out on the goddamn veranda, on the on the, on the uh, the terrace. Yeah, well, he, he is just really excited but, to like, experience... Anything. <laughs> all of the ladies. But, like, but there's... As you were saying, like there's this really interesting line that is being uh, held on to uh, through the through Banderas and Almodovar, which is he doesn't feel like a creep. Mm-mm. And granted, he it, is being a creep, but he doesn't feel super creepy. Yeah, it, and granted, like it is Antonio Banderas, so that you, might be why so, he doesn't feel like a creep. Like it's it, so. It, Little and cute. Yeah, and his glasses are so terrible so and adorable. Nerdy. Like, oh, and, and, he's so cute. And his clothes, like he's dressed so in clothes that are so big and baggy. They're so big. It's like a it's like when you see a child dressed up like your dad and you're like, you're like, what the fuck are you wearing, child? He is wearing a, t- a button down shirt that is easily four sizes too big for yeah, him. That him and Canela could both fit in and yes. there'd still be room. It's super cute. So but he he doesn't have a creep vibe though. Mm-hmm. Because he, I don't know. It, I think it's like this innocence. There's mm-hmm. like this sense of him. I mean, he is. First off, it is non-consensual at first. Mm-hmm. Eventually, it becomes consensual. But at first, he is definitely yeah trying to kiss her, and she is not interested. Um, which there's humor there, and some of it doesn't age well, but some of it really does. Mm-hmm. And um, 
it, but there is this sense of like inexperience. Um, he's moving in with his fiance, but they're they're they haven't had sex. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's this sense of uh, d- there's just like inexperience. Mm-hmm. It's like the it's kind of both of their sexual debuts. They're both just coming out into the world for the first time and mm-hmm. experiencing it for the first time. And you get the sense that. Um, and and Carlos has not met any other people. Yeah, like he only knows his fiance. Yeah, and he's been living with his grandparents, and and his mom has just gotten out of the hospital, and it's just all very new. Mm-hmm. So there's a sense of innocence. I feel like he, they're the representation of the kids that are coming out under Franco, and are like, whoa. Well, and even Candela is a character that fits in that same sort of attitude because she's running from uh, being in a relationship with. Uh, a Shiite terrorist who has taken advantage of her and she keeps talking about it. So there's an element of her innocence that's mm-hmm. also there. Like she doesn't know what she's doing. Mm-mm. She doesn't understand the actions that she's doing. And it doesn't mean that she should be taken advantage of. No. Like not at all. And, and I don't think the film is promoting the idea that she should be taken advantage of in no. anything. But that both of them don't know what they're doing is important. It isn't that one is really lecherous and obviously lecherous Mm-mm. and the other one is so innocent that Bambi blushes at her. Like it's that both... <laughs> It's that both of these characters are incredibly innocent and naive, and they are tr- and they are trying out their futures at the same time. <laughs> They're like thirteen year olds, but as twenty three year olds. And, and the amount of like, even though he's kissing her unconsensually, uh, without her consent, there's like there's a conversation. Like you can't like you really like, are into this, like, or you don't yes. need to do that. Like isn't this here? Like I do like it when she breaks into tears. Yeah, they're having like they're having a conversation. Even if it's an abrupt and short one, they're they're trying out how to communicate mm-hmm. with each other. It's a screwball comedy, right? There, it's humorous, but there is yes, there is an evolution mm-hmm. to their relationship. Yeah, and, and it, it's not going to end well for either of them. Probably not. Though I could also imagine them like in their like in their seventies together, still just <laughs> being dumb as fuck, <laughs> trying well, to figure things out. They are both really dumb. Yeah, which is super cute. Yeah, they. Like, like they're both, oh, you're like, oh, so you have angels. Like Peppa is just like, I do not have time for you. And Candela, by the way, those earrings are hilarious. Yeah. She's wearing coffee pot earrings. Yeah. And it's yeah. awesome. Yeah. Uh, also, also, when she tries to kill herself and nobody's looking. Yeah. Like, like, <laughs> She's her, like wait, but she didn't really. She's like, wait, I didn't mean it. <laughs> her, her answer to trying to get like people's attention is to try to kill herself but, by jumping off a roof and then losing her shoe. She, and uh, and then uh, it's it's really, really remarkable. She's like, but everybody's making these crazy choices. Yeah. Because Peppa decides with spiking the gazpacho. Yeah. Obviously to like drug the ex Mm -hmm. but you know not good yeah not great i mean he's a terrible person not a great idea and then let's just give it to everybody let's let's give it to the police officers because we got to get out of the situation and and that's and that's in part (laughs) what i'm talking about with the the hypocrisies of these characters are smaller they they seem like they seem more human than what was going on in the boone well film absolutely because all these little these all these little nuisances are chaotic human nature things that are are part of these characters lives is so much smaller it's not like i'm killing this person no like i'm i am like i am comedy i I am going to oppress a people like Mm -hmm. it's those things aren't there even when the cops show up the cops are played with such incredible joy and goofiness like the there's obviously the senior police officer and his junior police officer they drank their their gazpacho at the same time at the same time like in this perfectly staged moment (laughs) together or this thing or this or the incredible scene when they're there interrogating everybody <laughs> and the fucking phone operator shows up oh. and the phone operator's first thing is who are you show me your id i know <laughs> and not so- to assume that it's the homeowner <laughs> but everybody has to show id i love it i yeah. love it show and, id like it, it's it is truly like to be like okay so this guy who has maybe two minutes of screen time has more fucking common sense than everybody else. <laughs> who are you? The police. Well, come on in. Who are you? I'm a phone operator. Who are you? I'm the police. Let me see your ID. And he's <laughs> the one outside and they both show each other ID. God damn it. It's, it's so... Good. Uh, Other good moments I love is um, when Peppa takes down Iban's uh, 
suitcase mm-hmm. and his extra stuff and she throws it in the dumpster mm-hmm. next to the lawyer yeah. who's hiding in the car. Yeah. And then the lawyer gets out and puts it in the car. Uh-huh. Because she, obviously she knows it's his stuff, not knowing that there's absolutely nothing in there that's mm-hmm. worth keeping. That like burned carpet and stuff. But I love, I love that moment. I love, it's so funny to see her get out, be like, okay, cool. Get the stuff, shove it in the back of her car, get hit in the back of the head with the record. Uh-huh. And also admonish uh, a bond for, for hiding for hiding in the back in the the fucking phone booth. Yeah, it's like she's <laughs> the, so wonderfully hypocritical in that. Oh, the, but and and also it's just the let's talk about the phone for a minute again. Mm-hmm. I'm going to circle back to the phones. Mm-hmm. The the use of the phone, the misconnections, the leaving of the voicemail, the changing your voicemail, Mm -hmm. the I'm leaving for one minute to go throw this outside and that's exactly when this person calls me when I've been trying to talk to him all day. Yep. And then you're back in there and you can't, and you're like, God damn it. Just like that tension, that constant tension of missed communications Mm -hmm. is so fun and just very much of that era. It's always nice to kind of watch a film and and just feel that tension again that doesn't exist anymore right like the best you can do is your phone runs out of battery and you can use it with that but otherwise it's just you don't have that kind of missed connections Mm -hmm. too often these days so i just i love how much it constantly is because of it pulling her back to her apartment she's she does go out and look for him for a little bit Mm -hmm. but Mostly she has to keep coming back to her apartment because how else is she going to connect with him? Because she doesn't know where he is. Right. And what's amazing about that scene, for all her searching, he's in the phone booth outside her apartment and she she walks walks right by it. Oh, and that scene. As he's leaving a message on her recorder as she's throwing the shit out. And the incredible hypocritical moment for the, 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 the fucking feminist lawyer when she sees Peppa walking towards her, she ducks herself in the car only to admonish fucking uh, Abon for doing that from his uh, first first partner. Oh, yeah. They, they're just all doing the same thing. Yeah. But also that, that little scene right there that you just mentioned of Ibon in the phone booth is just a beautiful shot. Mm-hmm. Because first we see her walk past with his stuff while he's leaving the voicemail and she throws it away and we watch as... The lawyer hides from her. Mm-hmm. And then we see her walking back to her apartment. And we see Iban like hiding from her. Now seeing, I don't think he sees her in that moment. He's still on the phone leaving her the voicemail. But in the very far distance, you can see his ex-lover mm-hmm. starting walking down. Yep. And so you have all three in the triangle mm-hmm. in that one shot. Nobody seeing each other. Yeah. And it's just awesome for the foreshadowing of what about what it's about to blow up. Yeah. And we don't, we assume the cops are going to show up, but we don't, but we know she's about to show up Mm -hmm. when the doorbell rings and then the cops are right behind her. So funny. Yeah. It's, it's so wonderfully musical in its staging. Like it's the only scene I think in the film that is scored just with the music that's being played as you find out later on the, on the record. But like she comes down and the music plays, Mm. swells and it's so beautiful during this whole sequence. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It, it, yeah. It's, it's fucking great. I would love to talk about the interior design of this film mm-hmm. and how the chaos of the interior design. I mean, it is chaotic in its number of couches, mm-hmm. but it's also just so <laughs> vibrant. And, and as you said, energetic, mm-hmm. it's so reflective as well of the interiors of the, the characters mm-hmm. and not just i would say not just interiors of the character themselves that's in their place mm-hmm. so it isn't just like oh it only reflects peppa's interior it really reflects everyone's yeah insanity and i think that's so fun i love the idea of using your set design to reflect your own interior yeah like i think about uh, we we've talked about it before only murders in the building mm-hmm. such a wonderful show highly recommend but in that film, this this in that piece, the sets are so beautiful, mm-hmm. but they're also very same same, and mm-hmm. that they're all gorgeous but very similar. Everybody's place looks kind of the same. Mm-hmm. We won't get into it too much right now. But in this one, you just it's it's like what is happening on mm-hmm. the inside of these people? Yeah. Oh, I can actually literally see it. Yeah, there are ducks and roosters and chickens and yeah. bunnies. Yeah, and I I would also say that. 
while we don't spend a lot of time with other people's interiors, like we don't get to see Candela's house more than just her leaving quickly. Right. We just see a little brief bit. And, and we don't really get to spend much time with Lucia's house but we do get to see her with her parents, mm. which is a really fascinating thing that I, I'll pin in because we should come back to it. Absolutely. Everybody kind of takes to Peppa's house. And Peppa's house not only reflects her state of being, but it also reflects everybody else's. Everybody who enters into her world. And maybe that's why there's so many damn couches. because She knew everybody was coming over. Because everybody has a place to crash. Yeah. Um, even though most of them sleep on the floor. <laughs> uh, anyway, so what I was get, what I think I'm getting at is that everyone gets a chance to engage in their internal life through Peppa's house, mm-hmm. which is kind of how Peppa interacts with everybody. Like mm-hmm. she flirts with every motherfucker who comes she through her house. With everyone, like, I love it. Like her flirting knows no bounds, and she's great at it. She's and, so good at and it. No one should shame her for it. Nope. Like she's great at it. Like. Well, well done, Peppa. Get it, Peppa. Yeah, get get all of the shit that you want to get. Mm-hmm. Get it. Mm-hmm. And so, like, everybody's welcome into this chaotic world that she has created, and then everybody inhabits it. Very soon into their time there, Carlos and Candela are feeding the bunnies, like, helping water the lawn. Like, they're mm-hmm. doing shit. They make the gazpacho later. They add more <laughs> sleeping pills. Yes, because they needed more. Because it totally didn't work before on his girlfriend. Oh my God, she had a few <laughs> sips right out of the pitcher, I might add. Now yeah. I know this is a bit, I'm but, a little... No, but, but, but even that, like she takes to the house and acts as if this is her own. Like mm. in that same sense, she she just is like, no, 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 I, I can do this. Hang ups or not. I about- mean... I feel a little tense about that because I was like a little bit of COVID up in my, mm, yeah. I don't feel comfortable with you drinking straight out of the pitcher. But well, we also know, Emily, that you just go around to people's houses drinking out of their pitchers and putting them back. Like whatever's Absolutely. in it. You're like, I don't care. I'm lactose intolerant. I'll just matter. put this in me. I'm sure this is fine. <laughs> Normal. But like, ev- like it strikes me that everybody gets a chance to just engage with Peppa's house mm-hmm. as if it's their own space. They Everybody's all very comfortable. Yeah. They all feel very welcome there. And I think that that kind of chaotic design that is in the place fits Mm -hmm. that attitude. Like everybody has something that makes them feel at home there. Mm -hmm. And that crazy that they all are on the verge of. Yes, her best friend puts on Peppa's clothes. Yeah. Hey, I need to change. Mm-hmm. I hope it's cool. And she says, and you look like, better. Yeah, you look better in it than I do. It's yep. yours. Keep it. Yeah. But get, but you better keep your shoes because I don't have any in your size. Right. It is great that her shoes are enormous. Yeah. Um, And it's awesome. You're right. Everybody just kind of settles right in. Mm-hmm. Like uh, Carlos is reading her mail, which is like super creeptastic. If you yeah. think about it, if you extract yourself from it, and you're like, ew, dude, what are you doing? But then you realize like he's learning about his dad. He mm-hmm. doesn't know anything about his dad. So he's like seeing this romance from his dad. And he and this woman is like, I love you. You you are the best thing that my, my ex has ever done. Mm-hmm. Like you are my family now. Yeah. And so he's getting like, he says his mother doesn't want him because he she, reminds, he reminds her. her too much of yeah. Iban. And so here he's being embraced raced by this woman who's young and vibrant and it, mm-hmm. and unbeknownst to him is about to have another baby his little brother or sister mm-hmm. and so he's getting a family yeah and so in that you do see why he takes to it so quickly because yep. it's something he's craving and mm-hmm. he's a little baby Antonio Banderas and he's so cute yep uh, his next film would be uh, his next film with Almodovar would ruin that. Cuteness. Yes, we're not going to talk about that. Yeah. We're only going to worry about adorable baby face Antonio Banderas. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> we'll do that another day. Yeah, an- uh, another <laughs> Don't break day. It. Don't break it. No, no. Uh, but you brought up that you were interested in discussing um, Lucia and her parents. Yeah, and and the world there. Yeah, like the thing that I think is the thing that I love about that scene is again it's dealing with the past and dealing with. The present. Like, so when we first meet meet Lucia, like, she is getting dressed to uh, try to find a bond. She's going to go to his apartment and try to find him. And she puts on a wig and makeup. And I have to say that the wig makes her look so much older. I know. Like, like she's this beautiful woman. And then she puts on this wig. And I'm just like, what the fuck, man? Between her wig and her makeup, you're like, why do you eat yourself up by 20 years? But maybe that's the point. And, and And her mom is like, we should have thrown all this away. And then... Her dad comes in and is like, no, what harm can it do? He's very supportive of her. And what's interesting to me about that is that I think 
that we're supposed to take away the reverse of what is said, that the mom is right. She should throw away all that past. She mm. should throw it all away and there should be, like, she needs to get rid of this past. And the dad saying, what harm could it do? This makes her happy. And then basically telling his daughter that he loves her. His love is actually corrosive because it's allowing her to continue to be this person that is disassociated from her true self or from the world at least stuck in the past yeah it's where where being too kind to somebody does no good for them over a long period of time because like she should move on mm -hmm. from avon she should be moving forward with her life but she is stuck with this vibration that he gives her this this the shock or however she describes it. The memory of him. Of, of not even his voice or not even his face, but his voice. Yeah. Like that it just reverberates. Hearing the words that he's saying reverberates. And when I think about this, I think about trauma in general. And I think that in relationship to all the other men, save the taxi driver, her, Lucia's father is acting in the same way. This like passive meek no just let it be like let don't the, rock the boat yeah like don't make any waves don't change anything yeah like so you see them as kind of a representation of franco's dictatorship it's like don't rock the boat let's just stay the course don't look for something new i would i wouldn't say his dictatorship i would say the collaborators of the mm. the people that accepted that ruling idea mm -hmm. as truth and was like no this is fine this is good enough like you know what like i've got enough I, I don't need more. I don't need to have a full life. I can just have this one. And let's just be fine with that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I can see that. And I definitely think that you're right in saying that the representation is of moving forward is essential. Mm -hmm. So discarding the past, especially with everything they've been through, mm -hmm. to embrace this new self, of course, it's scary and terrifying, especially to the people where the patriarchy works for you and your benefit. So, yeah. of course, that's who's going to be okay with it. Mm-hmm. And of course, it's going to be scary, but exciting for all the people that it is not embraced by that. Yeah. So, yeah, I love which speaking of people not embraced by the patriarchy. Yeah. Mambo taxi driver. Yeah. He's amazing. Which like he is so obviously queer. He is Absolutely. so. He's he, Almodovar, don't you think? Uh, yes. Like Almodovar has his haircut later yeah. in life. Yeah. I think that's him. Yeah. Oh, he's so funny. Yeah. And sweet. Oh, and his taxi's amazing. Yeah, it has everything except for eye drops. And he's really sorry about that. But the next time he drives, he has eye drops. I love it. And I love his joke of like, oh, we keep getting together. My wife's not going to trust me. And he's so genuine. Yeah. He, he gives a real nice heart or allows... He actually, in the scene where Peppa first, first gets in his car and he's crying and she's... Is it the first time? Yes, when, no, oh no! The second time when she's crying, yeah, when and she's, she's going to see the lawyer, yeah, and, and he's crying, yeah, and it, even though it's used for kind of comic effect, there's something really empathetic about how he interacts with her mm -hmm. and allows us to see her in an empathetic way and a not like a shrew way or not a like someone who is holding on to something that shouldn't be done. Like she's not, she's given a layer of humanity mm -hmm. because of her. Because of him, because mm -hmm. of that, because of those scenes, I don't think I don't think the film works as well if he doesn't have as big a part. Mm -mm. He's wonderful. Yeah, but I also like I also like that when they're going to the airport mm -hmm. and uh, Lucia is shooting at them, mm -hmm. that he's like, no, no, yeah. mm -mm. I this is not this is I drive a taxi. Yeah. I'm here to get you places. I I've got your back. I've got everything provided for you in the back seat, but. We are not, you are not shooting at me. And I love, I like that when he gets, he does get her there mm -hmm. safely, but then he's not there to drive her back. Like, it's yeah. not this thing where he stays and he's he's running in with her yeah. and he's protecting her. He's like, he does his job and then he's out. Yeah. And I think that's really cool because I think too often we have like, we do drag the smaller characters in to give a bigger part. We drag them in to make them bigger and more important to the yeah. story than than they would be. Yeah. And I think he's just ugh, just perfect. Yeah, in a much worse movie, he would come in with Peppa, as would uh the the girlfriend of the biker. They would both come in as mm -hmm. well. Uh like we would have this little party of people around Peppa as she does it. Yeah. And she would have an audience. Instead, 
which is really important, I think, to the whole structure of her character. She is alone yeah. when she solves the problem. Yeah, because her flatmate or her neighbor goes off to find her yeah. and worries about her own boyfriend yep. who is kind of taken hostage. Yeah, by, by Lucia. Mm-hmm. Like, and, yeah, she's and, alone. And Peppa stops Lucia from shooting Avon and the feminist lawyer, which I just like saying. I know you like saying. It's, it's, I'm it's, not sure why she's a feminist, but yeah. I love that they call her I, a I, feminista. I, I, I kind of think that they're, I think that they're making fun of women who present that they're there for uh, for other women, mm-hmm. but are not. But who, like, if you think, like, her character quickly is presented as uh, Lucia's lawyer, mm-hmm. who then has an affair <gasps> with a bond. And she loses the lawsuit. And she loses the lawsuit. <gasps> this this woman, like, they're, like, it's such a joke, I feel, in the film that <sighs> that she's the feminist lawyer. Because she's she, not there for women. She's, she's there for her fucking self. Oh, so she's so you think she sabotages the lawsuit yep. against Ivan because she falls in love with him yep. to make sure that uh, that Lucia loses that case. <gasps> yeah, I I think I think that she's no. I think you're totally right. I think that she's just there to make fun of uh of women who are supposedly there for other women when we have Peppa who is obviously there for all the women that are she in her saves life. so many people's lives. Like, she's even there for the feminist lawyer. Yeah, like, she did. She saves her life. Yeah, and she asks for nothing in return from any of them other than to fuck right off. Well, that's, and that's, I mean, isn't that, isn't that the goal? Mm-hmm. Like, if you're going to have a horrible breakup, you, that at the end, you're like, I saved your life, and I don't even care what you have to say. Yeah. Peace. Jog on, motherfucker. Right? It's so, it's such a baller way to end, to be yeah. like, yeah, it seemed like I was super into you, mm-hmm. but guess what? I'm not. Saved your life. Bye. I'm going home to my amazing apartment. Don't ever talk to me again. Lose my number. Yes. Also, by the way, I'm having a baby, but I'm not going to tell you. Yep. Yeah. Like, it, it's I don't, so great. Yeah. I love that. No, that's great. Mm-hmm. In contrast to the feminist lawyer, mm-hmm. who sucks, Yeah. we have Peppa. And we discuss how she's there for everyone. Mm-hmm. But what I love about her character is that unlike many traditional female characters who are portrayed as caretakers. Mm -hmm. What you have is Peppa who is super fucking annoyed Mm -hmm. that everybody is trying to come and talk to her right now and needs her. And I found that really, really refreshing Mm -hmm. because too often women are portrayed as like the women, you come and we will drop everything for you, whatever you need. You are the most important person in the world. I I'm here to be your vessel mm-hmm. of fill in the blank. And I love it. I love that Candela is constantly calling her and leaving her these ridiculously annoying long messages. And Peppa's like, cool, I get it. You can stay here, but please just jog on because I need to go deal with my shit right now. Mm-hmm. And it's and it's eating me alive. And I'm just asking, I don't know, I'll help you in a bit, but just <laughs> jog on. And she does like refocus and help her friend when she's after she tries to jump off the roof. But she's also like, but, you know, I still got to deal with my shit. Mm -hmm. And I just really like that. Yeah. Because it's so empowering to showcase women being like, no, I have shit I need to deal with. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to deal with it. But I'm also going to help you because I love you. And I am going to be there for you. But it doesn't mean that it has to be my 100%. Yeah. And I love that. I think that's really empowering. Mm -hmm. I don't really have anything to add to that. Because it was such a great statement. And I'm so perfect. Yeah. I think that she's a really like she's an aspirational character for for writers in the sense that she she doesn't just sit down and become a a mother hen for anybody Mm-mm. as you're saying like it's just like she's just she's she has needs she has goals she has a plan of action and she's not going to get sidetracked by this bullshit that's Mm-mm. on the side like nope. she is so wonderfully drawn carmen mara does an incredible job with the performance regardless of all the shit that went on beyond behind the scenes with her and omadovar and that their working relationship breaking down on this film and them not working together for 18 years like it's yeah i guess they weren't talking to each other by the end of the movie yeah so like what happened and 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 really like to some degree it doesn't fucking matter that doesn't matter because like the film stands up like they they both were incredibly professional enough to do the shit well. Yeah. And absolutely. And I just can't imagine. Yeah, I can't it, imagine trying to film with an actor that's so mad at you 
they're not talking to you. No. I got so blown away yeah. by both their both of their abilities to be that angry and still execute this perfection. Mm-hmm. But also to show up every day and be professional and get it done, yep. even if whatever went down behind the scenes yeah. isn't great. I don't know. Yeah. I love Peppa. I think mm-hmm. Peppa is a fantastic character. And it's really, really nice to have a film run by such an interesting uh flawed human character Mm -hmm. we screened this a couple years ago um at latage here in philadelphia where we got to do this movie night once a month and we would screen movies that we thought were amazing we wanted basically all of our friends to come watch and i'll never forget sitting in the audience that night when we screened this and just everybody laughing so hard Mm -hmm. so much laughter so much joy Mm -hmm. it was just that was my favorite screening yeah. Was when we did this one because I just was, I knew it was funny. I think it's funny. I laugh all the time, but I didn't know how it would go over for the audience. And it, it was gangbusters. Yeah. And it was such a joy. And I think that's what I love about this film mm-hmm. is at the end of the day, even though all this crazy stuff is happening, it's just a joy. It's so fun. Mm-hmm. And like you said, at the end, the, Almodovar loves his characters. Mm-hmm. So they get what they want. Yeah. She wants to be at peace. She wants to be happy. She wants to have an answer. And she gets it for herself. She does. She finds it on her own. Yeah. On her own terms, she figures it out. Yeah. She doesn't need to be lied to anymore because she knows the truth. Mm-hmm. And I love that. I think she's... there, And they're all happy. They're mm-hmm. all happy. Mm-hmm. Even Marissa in yeah. her in her sex, sexual debut. Yeah. In her dreams. <laughs> yeah. They're, they're, they're all on a different path now mm-hmm. than they were at the beginning of the film. Yes. And what they were headed for was something awful. And what they're headed towards now is something unknown. Unknown. But it's not going to be what it was. But they're in charge of their own destiny. Yeah. They, and I love that. Yeah. So shall we discuss um, some stumble upons next? Yeah. Like, do you have anything you would like us to stumble upon? I do. In fact, you reminded me of this as you were talking about our our time at Latage when we were screening films. My favorite film that we ever screened there was a film called To Be or Not To Be by Ernst Lubitsch, which is... Just the best comedy. It's, it's also a comedy in the same sense that Women on the Verge is a comedy. Like it's it it hits some topics that you're just like, oh shit! Like I can't believe I'm laughing at this. Like it is the funniest World War II invading Poland actor troop trying to infiltrate a Hitler show that you'll ever see. Like it's like. It's amazing. It's it's really clear that uh, that uh, uh, Tarantino had seen this film and ripped it off for In- Inglorious Bastards. It's really clear that uh, Roberto Benigni was like, maybe I can do better with uh, Life is Beautiful. And frankly, he n- neither of them hold a torch to this film. No, this film is a masterpiece. It, it, is, it is really funny. It's really it's heartfelt. It's hilarious. It's like, it's just an incredible film. Like, it's really, really funny. It has... The last performance by Carol Lombard mm. before she tragically died in a plane crash. She's she was so funny. She was so fucking funny. Like mm-hmm. there are so many really, really good quotable lines in this film. That like it also co-stars a really young uh, Robert Stack. If you liked uh, Unsolved Mysteries back in the day, oh yeah, for our true crime fans. So. Uh, it's a it's an incredible film. Like Absolutely, it, to like, be or not to be. It, it's it's one to show for the holidays to make your parents confused, <laughs> but also to make them laugh. Yeah, because hopefully, it's so funny and unbelievable. Unless they don't was, like comedy. Unless they don't. But it is unbelievable that it was made during World War II. When you watch it, mm-hmm. it was made during World War II. Yeah. Go watch it. You're gonna not regret it. It's so good. Yeah. So I have something to recommend. Mm-hmm. We're stumbling upon next by the same director. Lubitsch. And this was one of his earlier films, made in 1933, called Design for Living. Another example of a screwball comedy that tackles a subject you certainly don't expect in 1933, which is basically polyamory. Mm -hmm. Um, Two best friends fall in love with the same woman, Mm -hmm. and she falls in love with both of them. Yep. And basically they come to terms with being like, this works for us. Let's do it. Yep. And it is really funny. It was pre-Haze Code. Yes. So we actually could still discuss sex 
mm-hmm. which apparently for a long time, cinema was like, what? You can't. And you could actually use the word sex mm-hmm. in a film. I know. So it's really, it's one of those films where you, this old 1933 black and white film, you are not expecting the subject matter to be what it is. Mm-hmm. So jump in and enjoy it. Yeah. It is really funny. Yeah. Uh, highly recommend. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for listening to this episode of Stumble Upon with us. And as always, you can find us on Instagram at Fishtown Films, where we'll let you know about what's coming up next, what we're going to be discussing next in the podcast, um, where you can slide into our DMs and let us know if you have any requests. Mm -hmm. And also where you can see what we do behind the scenes as a small indie film company. Yeah. And, And also feel free to jump into our Vimeo page and see some of the work that we make as filmmakers as well. Mm hmm. The link will be in our show notes today. So thank you all for stopping by and listening, and we hope you guys have an amazing holiday. Enjoy your family dinners. Take care. Bye.